everybody. I'm very happy to talk with you about running Java microservices on Kubernetes. I'm Julien Dubois. I've been using Java for more than 20 years, and I'm a Java champion. Usually, people know me in the Java world because I created and I still lead the Jeepster open source project, which you can find on GitHub, of course. Um, Today, I'm working for Microsoft and I'm leading the Java Developer Advocacy Team, which is a team of Java experts. And our role is to make Java easier on Azure and, of course, to make Azure easier for Java developers. Uh, and for today, we're going to talk about running Java microservices on Kubernetes. Of course, that includes running Java on Azure, but it's not limited to Azure, of course, because Kubernetes can run anywhere. So in this session, we are first going to have a little look back into history to see where we come from, to better understand where we are today, and also to open the door to the future and, and see how microservices might evolve in the, in the near future. Uh, so we're going first to talk about the past. And well, a long time ago, and old people like me uh, who have been doing Java for, for a couple of decades, uh, remember that time, Uh, well, we used to have something called EGB 1.0, and EGBs 1 were fully distributed Java components. So they were containing Java business log logic. They were distributed. You could discover them using a mechanism called GNDI. Uh, they were supposed to scale automatically under load. Well, it was not always the case, but that was the idea. Um, they could be fully configured by the GNDI server also. Um, and so, Of course, they were heavily criticized at that period because uh, they were not delivering the Java well, the developer experience that people were waiting for, and also because the performance were not as good as what people were expecting. But yet, uh, well, they already contain the best patterns that we use today in microservices, and that's why we have a lot to learn from that time. And also many companies use them successfully. I, I use them uh, in different uh, companies. and. I mean, they were considered successful projects. So, uh, I mean, uh, two decades ago, that was a very good solution. And let's have a look at what I just described to take a few important features from those EGBs and see how they apply today. So, first of all, we had service discovery. So, that's how one EGB could find another EGB and connect to it. You had scalability. So, that's how EGBs were supposed to grow or shrink uh, depending on the load. You had automatic configuration, so they could request the configuration from a GNDI server, for example, the database configuration, and that's how they could connect to those external services. Uh, they could be monitored, that's also why they scaled. Uh, that monitoring depended on the application server you were using. And well, they had a developer experience, which was not that good, but still, uh, well, you could, of course, work with them. Uh, and We're going to find those five major topics uh, when working with Java microservices today, and that's why they are still relevant. Uh, of course, EGBs have evolved. They still exist today. Well, now we've got EGB3. Uh, now they, they, they can be used also locally, and that's probably how most people are using them today. And they are usually part of a bigger monolith. So what is a monolith? Because we're speaking about microservices. A monolith is a big application where you could have different local EGBs, where you could have spring beans, where you could have any kind of Java code. But the issue is that at some point, you've, you're having so much code in the same place that is going to cause you two issues. The first one is technical issue. When you want to scale some part of your application, well, you can't because it's all in the same place. But you, the most important part is you're going to have an organization issue uh, if you have a huge team of, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 developers, if everybody work on the same code base, you're not going to be very agile when you want to update just one component is going to be complicated. So it it's not a good fit anymore when your project grows usually. Uh, so that's the issue with monoliths. And now with microservices, what happened since the GB1? Well, two things happened. First of all, we had newer, uh, let's say, Java technologies. We're going to speak about the Netflix uh, libraries very soon. And second thing, our infrastructure evolved a lot, typically with Kubernetes. And this has opened the door to a whole new uh, range of possibilities. So 
Let's have a look at what happened in 2013 when Netflix created a set of Java libraries for their own internal usage. So they were using AWS, so those were specific to AWS, but they have been ported today and they work anywhere, including inside Kubernetes. And so those libraries were usually successful. A few of them, are, I would say, are the old names for Java developers. Uh, Eureka, so Eureka is a discovery server, so that's how you could find your 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 microservices, uh, Zool. So Zool has got a funny name. It's a gateway. Uh, if you watch the film Ghostbusters, well, you know what Zool is. It's the, ga the the guardian of the door, and and so Zool is an open source gateway by uh, Netflix, which they have been using in production for years, by the way. And so those different libraries were part of the Netflix uh, stack, and the stack has been very successful. So I would say around 2013 to begin creating uh, Java microservices that would run in the cloud, so not specifically on Kubernetes in 2013, of course, but that was the, the beginning and they are still being heavily used today. Uh, so out of those first uh, uh, libraries, uh, the Spring team uh, packaged them and, and created what they called at the time Spring Cloud Netflix, which was released in 2015. And that stack became the de facto standard to run Java microservices in the cloud, including Azure, uh, including Azure and Kubernetes today, of course. Uh, and this allowed to have a dramatic change in the way we could code our applications and open the door to the great microservices architectures that we are experiencing today. Um, in the Gipster project, which I am leading, uh, we started to use those libraries very, very early before they were including into Spring. And of course, we followed the Spring path and now we are using Spring Cloud extensively. Uh, the Gipster project is important in this talk because uh, uh, I've been using those libraries for more than five years with Gipster. But what is more important is that we have tens of thousands of people who are using Gipster and who are using those libraries. So I have a very extensive experience uh, on using them and a lot of feedback. Uh, so now let's have a look at how this set of libraries uh, provides the five features we have talked about with EGB ones. So first of all, service discovery. So service discovery is made with Eureka. So Eureka is a, um, a discovery server, uh, which is I would say a bit special because they focus a lot on availability, but not a lot of consi on consistency. So uh, with Eureka, you can have some false information for a short amount of time, uh, usually a few seconds, maybe a few minutes if you're unlucky, uh, but it will always be eventually consistent and it will be highly available, especially because everybody has got a replica of the Eureka dictionary internally. So when you use Eureka, uh, you will always have access to that dictionary of services. The issue is that this dictionary is not always totally up to date. So that's one of the issues with Eureka. So the issue with Eureka also is that it doesn't scale very well if you have thousands of microservices, but it's not the case for everybody, of course. Uh, so Eureka is a service discovery uh, solution here. Uh, scalability, well, that set of libraries does not really do scalability. It uses the scalability from an underlying cloud like AWS, Azure, or now let's say Kubernetes. Uh, it allows to have configuration. So they had a configuration library. Let's not talk about uh, about it because it has been superseded today by uh, Spring Cloud Config and the Spring Cloud Config server is, is what everybody uses uh, with Spring Boot microservices. Uh, this uh, component is very useful to automatically configure your microservices. And what is awesome about it is that it can have a Git backend, which means that your microservices configuration can be installed into Git and source can be uh, committed, rollbacked, tagged. And that's really useful uh, when, when you have a lot of microservices that you want to configure. Fourth point, monitoring. Uh, well, they, all those libraries come with extensive monitoring, and of course, well, they, they should be included into a global monitoring system uh, like uh, Elastic. Last but not least, because that's where Spring shines, developer experience. So that's 
what made a world difference between that stack and what we were doing with EGBs. Uh, the developer experience is in Spring is usually very good and here again. So what is awesome about this is that you can code your microservices in your IDE very easily. You just open them up in, in your IDE. You can debug them, you can run them. It's very easy. Uh, so you have a, an excellent developer experience. And of course you can package those services and deploy them to the cloud very easily. Uh, so that approach has been very successful well in the past and still is today. Uh, it could only be successful, of course, if you, are, if you had an underlying uh, infrastructure that could scale your applications automatically. This is where Kubernetes is important. So you could totally do this outside of Kubernetes, but it really uh, shines when you are using Kubernetes. So this approach uh, has worked really well for years and in fact still does. Uh, we have a huge number of people using it. Uh, in fact, uh, with Jipster, it's still our, our default stack. It is very stable, very efficient. Uh, the performance is also very good. Uh, uh, basically, uh, you know, when a microservice finds another one, it just connects directly to it. So there's no uh, network run trip or anything. Uh, it's just directly connected to it. So it's really nice uh, from a performance point of view. It's of course uh, being used in production by a huge number of people. Um, what is changing today is that most of those Netflix libraries are being phased out by uh, Netflix uh, and they are being replaced. So for example, we talked about Zool. Zool is being replaced by the Spring Cloud Gateway. So the Spring Cloud Gateway is still a Java application, but it is fully reactive. It's using the Spring Reactor project. Uh, it's also supporting newer protocols. So it's better and more efficient than Zool and it's replacing it. But the overall pattern is the same. You still have a Java uh, a gateway uh, that you can use. And what is good with that gateway is that it is easy to develop on. And again, the developer experience stays the same and that's really good. Now, once you've got this set of services where well, you want to run them on Kubernetes, and if you want to run them uh, on Kubernetes, well, you've basically got two choices. Uh, first of all, you can roll your own. Uh, you install Kubernetes yourself, or you use a, a Kubernetes uh, uh, provided by your, your cloud uh, vendor. Typically, you can use Azure Kubernetes service. So it's better than installing Kubernetes yourself, but at the end, it's the same thing. You've still got Kubernetes running. Once you've got Kubernetes running, well, there is quite a lot of setup to do because if you want your discovery server to work, if you want your Spring Cloud config server to work, well, you need to install them. You need to scale them, to secure them and to maintain them. You know, you need to patch them when there's a new version. When there's a new version of Java, you need to patch everything. So uh, that's quite a lot of work, but it's, I mean, a lot of people are doing it this way. It works very, very well, of course. Uh, second solution is you can use uh, something called Azure Spring Cloud. So Azure Spring Cloud is a platform as a, as a service running on top of Kubernetes. So it's basically the same uh, uh, set of components, but this time uh, all the Spring Cloud uh, libraries are being managed by Azure. So this is a joint project by Microsoft Azure and VMware. So VMware is the company which is behind the Spring framework. So we at Microsoft do this with the people uh, doing Spring and together we have this managed and uh, fully operated uh, um, uh, service on top of Kubernetes. So you have exactly the same kind of capabilities that you had if you were installing Kubernetes by yourself, but you don't need to manage anything. You, you For example, if you take Eureka, uh, well, you can see it running, uh, but you, you, you are not operating it, you are not clustering it, you are not patching it, you are not doing anything, you are just using it. And this is managed by us and VMware. So you have the best experience without well, having anything to do. Uh, now let's have a look again at our five, imp at our five important features, but this time using uh, Azure Spring Cloud. So with Azure Spring Cloud, you still have service discovery, while it's still Eureka under the hood. Uh, you have scalability, while well, you just have a box where you can select to have auto scalability and it's working uh, automatically. You have configuration using the Spring Cloud config server. You have got monitoring, so this time we're using uh, Azure Monitor. So Azure Monitor allows you to 
monitor all your Java applications, but also to do distributed tracing. Because what is very important in when you are doing microservices, uh, when you have a performance issue, is that you want to know where that performance is issue appeared and what are its consequences. So for that, you need to have distributed tracing to, to see that, okay, this microservice is slow and this is causing this other one to be slower and this is because of this database. And for that, you need to have a global map of everything. And this is what uh, um, Azure Monitor is providing here. Uh, Please note that if you use Azure Spring Cloud, there is no vendor locking. You're not using any specific uh, Azure uh, API, for example. You are still using Spring. And so you can totally move away from Azure Spring Cloud to just run on a normal community server. The only difference, of course, is that you will need to install everything by yourself, like well, what you would have done if you went with my first roll your own solution, where well, you need to install Eureka, Spring Cloud config, uh, the monitoring, and so on. But it's exactly the same thing in the end. So that's the way that most people would use uh, uh, um, uh, Java microservices, uh, let's say today and also in the past. Now there's a, a, a new solution which is uh, pushed by a number of people, especially from ops people. Uh, so during the past five years, uh, 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 a lot of ops people have pushed to have a, what I would call a pure Kubernetes solution. So they don't want to use any of the Spring libraries we just talked about. Uh, they don't want to use Eureka. They don't want to use the Spring Cloud config server. There are a couple of reasons for that. The first one is that they want to be independent on the language. So uh, if you use Spring Cloud, it's, I would say, Java only experience. It's usually only used by, by Java developers. There is a version for .NET, which is called Stilto. So if you want to use .NET with Java, it's possible. But of course, you don't have the same solution if you want to use Go or Python. And usually when you do microservices, well, you've got different teams of people. And maybe you've got like three teams of Java developers, but there is one team of Go developers, one team of Python developers. And then it's complicated to, to have all of, the, all of them running on, on, on Spring Cloud. So this is why, well, this is the first reason why people are, are going with a, what I call a pure Kubernetes solution. The other reason why they do that is that they don't want to, the developers to have any uh, responsibility in, for example, network issues or service discovery. They believe that you, you should have developers that code uh, the business logic and that the infrastructure people should uh, manage the network issues and the, the server issues. Uh, that's an argument which has its pros and its cons. Uh, um, for example, let's imagine that uh, uh, microservices A is having some issue and you want to reach it with microservices with microservice B. Well, uh, maybe if you are a Java developer and you know the business logic, maybe you know that you want to do a retry on another server. Maybe you want to use microservice C because it's having an alternative solution. So uh, it can be good that Java developers have uh, uh, something to do with service discovery and, and retries and, and failover because they, they know the business logic and they can do probably more than people at the ops level who only see the network and the, and the nodes, for example. On the other hand, and that's the opposite argument, of course, maybe it's giving too much power to the Java developers. They, maybe it's not good for them to know anything about uh, HTTP requests at all. Maybe they just should call the other service, and then let the ops people manage uh, failover and network issues. So it's two different set of minds. They have their pros and cons again, but usually that's one of the reasons why people want to go pure Kubernetes uh, in order to uh, 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 limit the, what uh, the Java developers can do and see, because it's also going to make their life easier. easier. So. Now let's have a look at how this work using so this pure Kubernetes solution, and let's have a look at our five topics with Kubernetes. So service discovery, usually you do that with the Kubernetes DNS. So you call your, ser your service A, and while well, you're going to call A using your DNS, so it works very well, of course. Uh, it might be more efficient than uh, uh, using Eureka because Kubernetes, of course, knows perfectly well which node is working or not. Uh, you know, with Eureka, it's trying to discover those nodes and when a node fails, well, you have a timeout. And it's, it's during that time of this timeout that you can have issues because Eureka thinks that maybe the node is still up or maybe not. So uh, it 
could tell you that the node, node is here when it's not. Uh, with Kubernetes, of course, this does not happen because Kubernetes, well, the platform knows exactly which node is running because, well, Kubernetes is managing them itself. Um, Second topic, scalability. Of course, while well, you've got all the goodness of Kubernetes to scale your 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 nodes, so there is no issue on that. Configuration. So if you don't use Spring Cloud Config, uh, you can uh, do, I would say, something similar using Kubernetes. You can mount a, a configuration file or a secret, a Kubernetes secret. You can put your Spring configuration inside it, and you can mount it uh, on the local file system of a node. And when that file is mounted, so it's highly secured because it's Kubernetes, which is doing everything. And when your Spring Boot application will start, it will read that configuration file, which is local, and, and configure itself using it. So it's less powerful than you, what you can do with Spring Cloud Config, because with Spring Cloud Config, well, you've got more options. You can use Git. You can also refresh some configuration at runtime. Well, you can do a lot more with Spring Cloud Config. But still, just mounting a configuration file locally like that, well, it solves already quite a lot of problems. Fourth topic, monitoring. Well, with Kubernetes, you have a lot of monitoring solutions. I'm usually, usually using Elastic for that. And last but not least, because it's going to be the issue here, it's developer experience. Well, the developer experience with Kubernetes is traditionally not very good. Uh, well, because first, installing Kubernetes locally is not easy. Well, now with Docker, uh, it's becoming easier, but still it's quite heavy, it's quite slow. Uh, if you need to package your image uh, and then run it, it's, well, it's going to take you a few minutes. And also, it's not very easy to debug. You can debug uh, uh, your Docker image remotely, but honestly, it's a lot more complicated than just running debug on your IDE, which what you were doing with, uh, with the, the, the Spring Cloud libraries. So here, uh, what is interesting is that you totally separate the business code done by the Java developers from the infrastructure, which is done by the Kubernetes uh, operators. And that's exactly what the original EGB1 wanted to do. Uh, so it's, it's good on that point. But uh, again, uh, is that a good idea to separate totally those two uh, topics? It depends on what you, you want to achieve. Maybe it's good that the Java developers know more about the the network we tries because they know uh, what to do when there is a when there is an issue on a specific microservice, and also uh, the developer experience here is not very good. It's clearly something that is pushed by by ops and not by developers, and uh, that's not a, 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 I would say a, a solution which is as advanced as what we have by using Spring Cloud. Uh, the main argument, again, uh, by doing pure Kubernetes, it's that it's language agnostic. So it can run with any language. So of course, this talk is about running Java microservices on Kubernetes, but maybe you are not only running Java uh, in your microservices. So that would be a good argument to use this Kubernetes-only uh, solution. Anyway, uh, this is a very good architecture, of course, from a, a, an infrastructure point of view, and that's why many ops team are, are pushing it, uh, even if it's so a little bit basic for, for finding a node, for, uh, uh, for configuration. And uh, a lot of people have been having a look at how they could improve that. So first thing, uh, first solution that appeared was service meshes. So you probably all have heard about Istio. It's not the only one, uh, and uh, that kind of solution facilitates uh, a lot of those things. Uh, but in the end, it's going to be the same experience. It's going to help you uh, when a node fails. Uh, but it's basically the same experience as what we just discussed. And the developer experience is still not very good. Um, as of today, uh, uh, for me, the, the, the solution that has the most, or well, the biggest potential is something called Dapper. So Dapper comes from Microsoft. and well, I work for Microsoft, that's also why I know Dapper quite well. Uh, but it's an open source project, it's free, and it can run anywhere. It's not tied to Azure, so you can totally run it on another cloud. Uh, and Dapper is doing many things, but among those many things, it's going to try to solve the issues we have just seen. So technically, it can run either on Kubernetes or it can run locally on your machine. So you can already guess that it's going to solve our developer experience problem. Uh, and so again, it's doing many things, but if we take into account our five points from before, 
uh, it's mainly going to act as a proxy between your services. It's going to be responsible for finding the services. It's going to be responsible for securing them, for doing load balancing, uh, and that removes all those uh, uh, issues that we just had before. So let's have a look at our five topics, and then let's have a look a little bit more into the detail. So first of all, service discovery. Well, with Dapper, uh, well, I would say the issue is totally solved because uh, you just ask Dapper to give you a service and it's Dapper's uh, role to do that work for you. So it's totally replacing uh, Eureka or uh, uh, well, the service discovery mechanism we had before. Scalability, well, Dapper is of course uh, fully scalable. It's running in fact uh, next to your node, it's a sidecar usually, uh, and um, it relies on Kubernetes to scale. Uh, configuration, so this is one of the important points about Dapper. It can read configuration from different sources, including from a vault. So you could have like secured uh, 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 data uh, properties that can be read from Dapper and Dapper will then inject them into your, your application. So you have a full configuration uh, system here, which is far more powerful than what we had with, I would say, pure Kubernetes. Uh, monitoring is of course including included inside Dapper, and then, well, you need to, to manage that with uh, your Kubernetes cluster. And last but not least, the most important part, developer experience. Well, everything you do with Dapper in Kubernetes, you can do locally, you can install it locally, and you can run it locally. So we back to what we add with the Spring Cloud uh, 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 libraries. Uh, you can run everything locally, and then you can deploy to the cloud and have all the goodness of the cloud and, of, and on Kubernetes in production while uh, still being able to develop and debug locally, which is the most important part as a Java developer. So let me just finish on Dapper by saying that it's still a very new technology. Uh, you can already run it in production. Some people already do, but it's still very new. So of course, uh, it's probably not as stable as you know the five years of experience that we have on, on, on Spring Cloud or if you take the Netflix libraries, it's now nearly 10 years of experience. So of course, you, it's not something you can have overnight, but it's one of the nice trends that we have in the future and I have great hopes about it. Uh, so let me just summarize what we just talked about. And also let me add that you can also mix and match those solutions. I mean, you can use Dapper to find your microservices, but you can use Spring Cloud Config to configure them. So I mean, it, it's not because you mix and match them that it, it's a bad idea. Maybe you can use each of them for what it is the best. Uh, so let me try to summarize what we just saw. So microservices are in fact quite old in Java. We, we've been running that for, I would say, like a couple of decades. And since the last decade, we've had some very good solutions from Netflix. Uh, Spring Cloud is the de facto standard today in Java. It's what everybody is using. It's very stable, very mature, and it continues to evolve. So there are new libraries replacing the older one, but still the same, the same idea. And that's why uh, that's what we provide by default with Jipster and also in Azure. That's why we rely on that for Azure Spring Cloud because it's the most stable and mature technology and it's what everybody is using today. Also, the developer experience is awesome. You can either run it and configure it manually or run it inside Kubernetes. And that's really great from a developer perspective. Then, more recently, we've had a push from ops people to use a pure Kubernetes solution, which has mainly the advantage of being fully neutral at the application level. So you, all you need is Kubernetes and it runs with all languages. So that's a good uh, uh, alternative. And then if we look into the future, we've got Dapper, which is arriving on top of Kubernetes to transform it. Uh, first of all, help it being uh, uh, you know, with service discovery, configuration, and so on, but also help developers to run those microservices locally and have an experience which is similar to the one you had with Spring Cloud, but this time locally. So again, that's probably a glimpse into the future because it's still a new library, but it's a very promising one. So uh, we've seen a lot of things today. Uh, I will put uh, at the end of this talk uh, a few notes and a few links to, well, to Spring Cloud, Jipster, Dapper, and so on. And I encourage you, of course, to go and read more about them. Uh, also, if you want to reach out and ask questions, I'm always available on Twitter, and I'm always very happy to, to talk about all of those uh, well questions, issues, and, and new technologies. Thank you.